University Subjects Lecture 8 of The Idea of a University by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 8, Christianity and Scientific Investigation, a lecture written for the School of Science. This is a time, gentlemen, when not only the classics, but much more the sciences, in the largest sense of the word, are looked upon with anxiety, not altogether ungrounded, by religious men. And whereas a university such as ours professes to embrace all departments and exercises of the intellect, and since I for my part wish to stand on good terms with all kinds of knowledge, and have no intention of quarrelling with any, and would open my heart, if not my intellect, for that is beyond me, to the whole circle of truth, and would tender at least a recognition and hospitality, even to those studies which are strangers to me, and would speed them on their way. Therefore, as I have already been making overtures of reconciliation, first between polite literature and religion, and next between physics and theology, so I would now say a word by way of deprecating and protesting against the needless antagonism which sometimes exists in fact between divines and the cultivators of the sciences generally. Here I am led at once to expatiate on the grandeur of an institution which is comprehensive enough to admit the discussion of a subject such as this. Among the objects of human enterprise, I may say it surely without extravagance, gentlemen, none higher or nobler can be named than that which is contemplated in the erection of a university. To set on foot and to maintain in life and vigour a real university is confessedly, as soon as the word university is understood, one of those greatest works, great in their difficulty and their importance, on which are deservedly expended the rarest intellects and the most varied endowments. For, first of all, it professes to teach whatever has to be taught in any whatever department of human knowledge, and it embraces in its scope the loftiest subjects of human thought and the richest fields of human inquiry. Nothing is too vast, nothing too subtle, nothing too distant, nothing too minute, nothing too discursive, nothing too exact, to engage its attention. This, however, is not the reason why I claim for it so sovereign a position. For, to bring schools of all knowledge under one name, and call them a university, may be fairly said to be a mere generalisation, and to proclaim that the prosecution of all kinds of knowledge to their utmost limits demands the fullest reach and range of our intellectual faculties is but a truism, my reason for speaking of a university in the terms on which I have ventured is not that it occupies the whole territory of knowledge merely, but that it is the very realm, that it professes much more than to take in and to lodge as in a caravanserai all art and science, all history and philosophy. In truth, it professes to assign to each study which it receives its own proper place and its just boundaries to define the rights, to establish the mutual relations, and to effect the intercommunion of one and all, to keep in check the ambitious and encroaching, and to succour and maintain those which from time to time are succumbing under the more popular or the more fortunately circumstanced, to keep the peace between them all, and to convert their mutual differences and contrarieties into the common good. This, gentlemen, is why I say that to erect a university is at once so arduous and beneficial an undertaking, viz. because it is pledged to admit without fear, without prejudice, without compromise, all comers, if they come in the name of truth, to adjust views and experiences and habits of mind the most independent and dissimilar, and to give full play to thought and erudition in their most original forms, and their most intense expressions, and in their most ample circuit. Thus to draw many things into one is its special function, and it learns to do it not by rules reducible to writing, but by sagacity, wisdom, and forbearance, acting upon a profound insight into the subject matter of knowledge, and by a vigilant repression of aggression or bigotry in any quarter. We count it a great thing, and justly so, to plan and carry out a wide political organisation, to bring under one yoke after the manner of old Rome, a hundred discordant peoples, to maintain each of them in its own privileges within its legitimate range of action, 
to allow them severally the indulgence of national feelings and the stimulus of rival interests, and yet withal to blend them into one great social establishment, and to pledge them to the perpetuity of the one imperial power. This is an achievement which carries with it the unequivocal token of genius in the race which effects it. To regere imperio populus Romane memento. This was the special boast, as the poet considered it, of the Roman, a boast as high in its own line as that other boast, proper to the Greek nation, of literary preeminence, of exuberance of thought, and of skill and refinement in expressing it. What an empire is in political history, such is a university in the sphere of philosophy and research. It is, as I have said, the high protecting power of all knowledge and science, of fact and principle, of inquiry and discovery, of experiment and speculation. It maps out the territory of the intellect, and sees that the boundaries of each province are religiously respected, and that there is neither encroachment nor surrender on any side. It acts as umpire between truth and truth, and, taking into account the nature and importance of each, assigns to all their due order of precedence. It maintains no one department of thought exclusively, however ample and noble, and it sacrifices none. It is deferential and loyal, according to their respective weight, to the claims of literature, of physical research, of history, of metaphysics, of theological science. It is impartial towards them all, and promotes each in its own place and for its own object. It is ancillary, certainly, and of necessity, to the Catholic Church, but in the same way that one of the Queen's judges is an officer of the Queen's, and nevertheless determines certain legal proceedings between the Queen and her subjects. It is ministrative to the Catholic Church, first, because truth of any kind can but minister to truth, and next, still more, because nature ever will pay homage to grace, and reason cannot but illustrate and defend revelation. And thirdly, because the Church has a sovereign authority, and, when she speaks ex cathedra, must be obeyed. But this is the remote end of a university. Its immediate end, with which alone we have here to do, is to secure the due disposition according to one sovereign order, and the cultivation in that order, of all the provinces and methods of thought which the human intellect has created. In this point of view, its several professors are like the ministers of various political powers at one court or conference. They represent their respective sciences, and attend to the private interests of those sciences respectively, and should dispute arise between those sciences, they are the persons to talk over and arrange it, without risk of extravagant pretensions on any side, of angry collision, or of popular commotion. A liberal philosophy becomes the habit of minds thus exercised, a breadth and spaciousness of thought in which lines seemingly parallel may converge at leisure, and principles, recognised as incommensurable, may be safely antagonistic. And here, gentlemen, we recognise the special character of the philosophy I am speaking of, if philosophy it is to be called, in contrast with the method of a strict science or system. Its teaching is not founded on one idea, or reducible to certain formulae. Newton might discover the great law of motion in the physical world, and the key to ten thousand phenomena, and a similar resolution of complex facts into simple principles may be possible in other departments of nature. But the great universe itself, moral and material, sensible and supernatural, cannot be gauged and meted by even the greatest of human intellects, and its constituent parts admit indeed of comparison and adjustment, but not of fusion. This is the point which bears directly on the subject which I set before me when I began, and towards which I am moving in all that I have said or shall be saying. I observe then, and ask you gentlemen to bear in mind, that the philosophy of an imperial intellect for such I am considering a university to be, is based not so much on simplification as on discrimination. Its true representative defines rather than analyses. He aims at no complete catalogue or interpretation of the subjects of knowledge, but a following out, as far as man can, what in its fullness is mysterious and unfathomable. 
taking into his charge all sciences, methods, collections of facts, principles, doctrines, truths, which are the reflections of the universe upon the human intellect, he admits them all, he disregards none, and as disregarding none, he allows none to exceed or encroach. His watchword is, live and let live. He takes things as they are, he submits to them all as far as they go. He recognises the insuperable lines of demarcation which run between subject and subject. He observes how separate truths lie relatively to each other, where they concur, where they part company, and where, being carried too far, they cease to be truths at all. It is his office to determine how much can be known in each province of thought, when we must be contented not to know, in what direction inquiry is hopeless, or on the other hand full of promise where it gathers into coils insoluble by reason, where it is absorbed in mysteries or runs into the abyss. It will be his care to be familiar with the signs of real and apparent difficulties, with the methods proper to particular subject matters, what in each case are the limits of a rational scepticism, and what the claims of a peremptory faith. If he has one cardinal maxim in his philosophy, it is that truth cannot be contrary to truth. If he has a second, it is that truth often seems contrary to truth. And if a third, it is the practical conclusion that we must be patient with such appearances, and not be hasty to pronounce them to be really of a more formidable character. It is the very immensity of the system of things, the human record of which he has in charge, which is the reason of this patience and caution. For that immensity suggests to him that the contrarieties and mysteries which meet him in the various sciences may be simply the consequences of our necessarily defective comprehension. There is but one thought greater than that of the universe, and that is the thought of its maker. If, gentlemen, for one instant, leaving my proper train of thought, I allude to our knowledge of the supreme being, it is in order to deduce from it an illustration bearing upon my subject. He, though one, is a sort of world of worlds in himself, giving birth in our minds to an infinite number of distinct truths, each ineffably more mysterious than anything that is found in this universe of space and time. Any one of his attributes, considered by itself, is the object of an inexhaustible science, and the attempt to reconcile any two or three of them together, love, power, justice, sanctity, truth, wisdom, affords matter for an everlasting controversy. We are able to apprehend and receive each divine attribute in its elementary form, but still we are not able to accept them in their infinity, either in themselves or in union with each other. Yet we do not deny the first, because it cannot be perfectly reconciled with the second, nor the second, because it is in apparent contrariety with the first and the third. The case is the same in its degree with his creation material and moral. It is the highest wisdom to accept truth of whatever kind, wherever it is clearly ascertained to be such, though there be difficulty in adjusting it with other known truth. Instances are easily producible of that extreme contrariety of ideas, one with another, which the contemplation of the universe forces upon our acceptance, making it clear to us that there is nothing irrational in submitting to undeniable incompatibilities, which we call apparent, only because, if they were not apparent but real, they could not coexist. Such, for instance, is the contemplation of space, the existence of which we cannot deny, though its idea is capable, in no sort of posture, of seating itself, if I may so speak, in our minds. For we find it impossible to say that it comes to a limit anywhere, and it is incomprehensible to say that it runs out infinitely, and it seems to be unmeaning if we say that it does not exist till bodies come into it, and thus is enlarged according to an accident. And so again in the instance of time. We cannot place a beginning to it without asking ourselves what was before that beginning, yet that there should be no beginning at all, put it as far back as we will, is simply incomprehensible. Here again, as in the case of space, we never dream of denying the existence of what we have no means of understanding. And passing from this high region of thought, which, high as it may be, is the subject even of a child's contemplations, when we come to consider the mutual action of soul and body, 
we are specially perplexed by incompatibilities which we can neither reject nor explain. How it is that the will can act on the muscles is a question of which even a child may feel the force, but which no experimentalist can answer. Further, when we contrast the physical with the social laws under which man finds himself here below, we must grant that physiology and social science are in collision. Man is both a physical and a social being, yet he cannot at once pursue to the full his physical end and his social end, his physical duties, if I may so speak, and his social duties, but is forced to sacrifice in part one or the other. If we were wild enough to fancy that there were two creators, one of whom was the author of our animal frames, the other of society, then indeed we might understand how it comes to pass that labour of mind and body, the useful arts, the duties of a statesman, government and the like, which are required by the social system, are so destructive of health, enjoyment and life. That is, in other words, we cannot adequately account for existing and undeniable truths except on the hypothesis of what we feel to be an absurdity. And so, in mathematical science, as has often been insisted on, the philosopher has patiently to endure the presence of truths which are not the less true for being irreconcilable with each other. He is told of the existence of an infinite number of curves which are able to divide a space into which no straight line, though it be length without breadth, can even enter. He is told, too, of certain lines which approach to each other continually, with a finite distance between them, yet never meet. And these apparent contrarieties he must bear as he best can, without attempting to deny the existence of the truths which constitute them in the science in question. Now, let me call your attention, gentlemen, to what I would infer from these familiar facts. It is to urge you with an argument a fortiori, viz. that, as you exercise so much exemplary patience in the case of the inexplicable truths which surround so many departments of knowledge, human and divine, viewed in themselves, as you are not at once indignant, censorious, suspicious, difficult of belief, on finding that in the secular sciences one truth is incompatible, according to our human intellect, with another, or inconsistent with itself, so you should not think it very hard to be told that there exists, here and there, not an inextricable difficulty, not an astounding contrariety, not, much less, a contradiction, as to clear facts, between revelation and nature, but a hitch, an obscurity, a divergence of tendency, a temporary antagonism, a difference of tone between the two. That is, between Catholic opinion on the one hand, and astronomy, or geology, or physiology, or ethnology, or political economy, or history, or antiquities, on the other. I say that, as we admit, because we are Catholics, that the divine unity contains in it attributes which, to our finite minds, appear in partial contrariety with each other, as we admit that in his revealed nature are things which, though not opposed to reason, are infinitely strange to the imagination, as in his works we can neither reject nor admit the ideas of space and of time and the necessary properties of lines without intellectual distress or even torture, really, gentlemen, I am making no outrageous request when, in the name of a university, I ask religious writers, jurists, economists, physiologists, chemists, geologists and historians to go on quietly and in a neighbourly way in their own respective lines of speculation, research and experiment with full faith in the consistency of that multiform truth which they share between them, in a generous confidence that they will be ultimately consistent, one and all, in their combined results, though there may be momentary collisions, awkward appearances, and many forebodings and prophecies of contrariety, and at all times things hard to the imagination, though not, I repeat, to the reason. It surely is not asking them a great deal to beg of them, since they are forced to admit mysteries in the truths of revelation taken by themselves, and in the truths of reason taken by themselves, to beg of them, I say, to keep the peace, to live in good will, and to exercise equanimity, if, when nature and revelation are compared with each other, there be, as I have said, discrepancies, not in the issue, 
but in the reasonings, the circumstances, the associations, the anticipations, the accidents proper to their respective teachings. It is most necessary to insist seriously and energetically on this point for the sake of Protestants, for they have very strange notions about us. In spite of the testimony of history the other way, they think that the Church has no other method of putting down error than the arm of force or the prohibition of inquiry. They defy us to set up and carry on a school of science. For their sake, then, I am led to enlarge upon the subject here. I say, then, he who believes in revelation with that absolute faith which is the prerogative of a Catholic is not the nervous creature who startles at every sound and is fluttered by every strange or novel appearance which meets his eyes. He has no sort of apprehension. He laughs at the idea that anything can be discovered by any other scientific method which can contradict any one of the dogmas of his religion. He knows full well there is no science whatever, but in the course of its extension runs the risk of infringing, without any meaning of offence on its own part, the path of other sciences. And he knows also that, if there be any one science, which, from its sovereign and unassailable position, can calmly bear such unintentional collisions on the part of the children of earth, it is theology. He is sure, and nothing shall make him doubt, that, if anything seems to be proved by astronomer, or geologist, or chronologist, or antiquarian, or ethnologist, in contradiction to the dogmas of the faith, that point will eventually turn out first not to be proved, or secondly not contradictory, or thirdly not contradictory to anything really revealed, but to something which has been confused with revelation. And if at the moment it appears to be contradictory, then he is content to wait, knowing that error is like other delinquents, give it rope enough and it will be found to have a strong suicidal propensity. I do not mean to say he will not take his part in encouraging, in helping forward the prospective suicide. He will not only give the error rope enough, but show it how to handle and adjust the rope. He will commit the matter to reason, reflection, sober judgment, common sense. To time, the great interpreter of so many secrets. Instead of being irritated at the momentary triumph of the foes of revelation, if such a feeling of triumph there be, and of hurrying on a forcible solution of the difficulty, which may, in the event, only reduce the inquiry to an inextricable tangle, he will recollect that, in the order of providence, our seeming dangers are often our greatest gains, that, in the words of the Protestant poet, the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy, and shall break in blessings on your head. To one notorious instance, indeed, it is obvious to allude here. When the Copernican system first made progress, what religious man would not have been tempted to uneasiness, at least fear of scandal, from the seeming contradiction which it involved to some authoritative tradition of the Church and the declaration of Scripture? It was generally received, as if the apostles had expressly delivered it, both orally and in writing, as a truth of revelation, that the earth was stationary, and that the sun, fixed in a solid firmament, whirled around the earth. After a little time, however, and on full consideration, it was found that the church had decided next to nothing on questions such as these, and that physical science might range in this sphere of thought almost at will, without fear of encountering the decisions of ecclesiastical authority. Now, Besides the relief which it afforded to Catholics to find that they were to be spared this addition on the side of cosmology to their many controversies already existing, there is something of an argument in this very circumstance in behalf of the divinity of their religion. For surely it is a very remarkable fact, considering how widely and how long one certain interpretation of these physical statements in Scripture had been received by Catholics, that the Church should not have formally acknowledged it. Looking at the matter in a human point of view, it was inevitable that she should have made that opinion her own. But now we find, on ascertaining where we stand, in the face of the new sciences of these latter times, that in spite of the bountiful comments which from the first she has ever been making on the sacred text, as it is her duty and her right to do, nevertheless she has never been led formally to explain the texts in question, or to give them an authoritative sense which modern science may question. Nor was this escape a mere accident, but rather the result of a providential superintendence, 
as would appear from a passage of history in the Dark Age itself. When the glorious St. Boniface, apostle of Germany, great in sanctity though not in secular knowledge, complained to the Holy See that St. Virgilius taught the existence of the Antipodes, the Holy See was guided what to do. It did not indeed side with the Irish philosopher, which would have been going out of its place, but it passed over, in a matter not revealed, a philosophical opinion. Time went on. A new state of things, intellectual and social, came in. The church was girt with temporal power. The preachers of St. Dominic were in the ascendant. Now, at length, we may ask with curious interest, did the church alter her ancient rule of action and prescribe intellectual activity? Just the contrary. This is the very age of universities. It is the classical period of the schoolmen. It is the splendid and palmary instance of the wise policy and large liberality of the church as regards philosophical inquiry. If there ever was a time when the intellect went wild and had a licentious revel, it was at the date I speak of. When was there ever a more curious, more meddling, bolder, keener, more penetrating, more rationalistic exercise of the reason than at that time? What class of questions did that subtle metaphysical spirit not scrutinise? What premise was allowed without examination? What principle was not traced to its first origin and exhibited in its most naked shape? What whole was not analysed? What complex idea was not elaborately traced out and, as it were, finely painted for the contemplation of the mind till it was spread out in all its minutest portions as perfectly and delicately as a frog's foot shows under the intense scrutiny of the microscope? Well, I repeat, here was something which came somewhat nearer to theology than physical research comes. Aristotle was a somewhat more serious foe then, beyond all mistake, than Bacon has been since. Did the church take a high hand with philosophy then? No, not though that philosophy was metaphysical. It was a time when she had temporal power and could have exterminated the spirit of inquiry with fire and sword. But she determined to put it down by argument. She said, two can play at that and my argument is the better. She sent her controversialists into the philosophical arena. It was the Dominican and Franciscan doctors, the greatest of them being St. Thomas, who in those medieval universities fought the battle of revelation with the weapons of heathenism. It was no matter whose the weapon was, truth was truth all the world over. With the jawbone of an ass, with the skeleton philosophy of pagan Greece, did the Samson of the schools put to flight his thousand Philistines. Here, gentlemen, observe the contrast exhibited between the church herself, who has the gift of wisdom, and even the ablest or wisest or holiest of her children. As St. Boniface had been jealous of physical speculations, so had the early fathers shown an extreme aversion to the great heathen philosopher whom I just now named, Aristotle. I do not know who of them could endure him. And when there arose those in the Middle Age who would take his part, especially since their intentions were of a suspicious character, a strenuous effort was made to banish him out of Christendom. The church the while had kept silence. She had as little denounced heathen philosophy in the mass as she had pronounced upon the meaning of certain texts of scripture of a cosmological character. From Tertullian and Caius to the two Gregories of Cappadocia, from them to Anastasia Sinaita, from him to the school of Paris, Aristotle was a word of offence. At length, St. Thomas made him a hewer of wood and a drawer of water to the church. A strong slave he is, and the church herself has given her sanction to the use in theology of the ideas and terms of his philosophy. Now, while this free discussion is, to say the least, so safe for religion, or rather so expedient, it is, on the other hand, simply necessary for progress in science, and I shall now go on to insist on this side of the subject. I say, then, that it is a matter of primary importance in the cultivation of those sciences in which truth is discoverable by the human intellect, that the investigator should be free, independent, unshackled in his movements, that he should be allowed and enabled without impediment to fix his mind intently, nay exclusively, on his special object, without the risk of being distracted every other minute in the process and progress of his inquiry by charges of temerariousness, or by warnings against extravagance or scandal. 
But in thus speaking, I must premise several explanations, lest I be misunderstood. First then, gentlemen, as to the fundamental principles of religion and morals, and again as to the fundamental principles of Christianity, or what are called the dogmas of faith, as to this double creed, natural and revealed, we none of us should say that it is any shackle at all upon the intellect to maintain these inviolate. Indeed, a Catholic cannot put off his thought of them, and they as little impede the movements of his intellect as the law of physics impede his bodily movements. The habitual apprehension of them has become a second nature with him, as the laws of optics, hydrostatics, dynamics, are latent conditions which he takes for granted in the use of his corporeal organs. I am not supposing any collision with dogma. I am but speaking of opinions of divines, or of the multitude, parallel to those in former times of the sun going round the earth, or of the last day being close at hand, or of St. Dionysius the Areopagite being the author of the works which bear his name. Nor, secondly, even as regards such opinions, am I supposing any direct intrusion into the province of religion of a teacher of science actually laying down the law in a matter of religion, but of such unintentional collisions as are incidental to a discussion pursued on some subject of his own. It would be a great mistake in such a one to propose his philosophical or historical conclusions as the formal interpretation of the sacred text, as Galileo is said to have done, instead of being content to hold his doctrine of the motion of the earth as a scientific conclusion, and leaving it to those whom it really concerned to compare it with scripture. And it must be confessed, gentlemen, not a few instances occur of this mistake at the present day, on the part not indeed of men of science, but of religious men, who from a nervous impatience, lest scripture should for one moment seem inconsistent with the results of some speculation of the hour, are ever proposing geological or ethnological comments upon it, which they have to alter or obliterate before the ink is well dry, from changes in the progressive science, which they have so officiously brought to its aid. And thirdly, I observe that, when I advocate the independence of philosophical thought, I am not speaking of any formal teaching at all, but of investigations, speculations, and discussions. I am far indeed from allowing in any matter which even borders on religion what an eminent Protestant divine has advocated on the most sacred subjects, I mean the liberty of prophesying. I have no wish to degrade the professors of science, who ought to be prophets of the truth, into mere advertisers of crude fancies or notorious absurdities. I am not pleading that they should at random shower down upon their hearers ingenuities and novelties, or that they should teach even what has a basis of truth in it, in a brilliant off-hand way, to a collection of youths who may not perhaps hear them for six consecutive lectures, and who will carry away with them into the country a misty idea of the half-created theories of some ambitious intellect. Once more, as the last sentence suggests, there must be great care taken to avoid scandal, or shocking the popular mind, or unsettling the weak, the association between truth and error being so strong in particular minds that it is impossible to weed them of the error without rooting up the wheat with it. If then there is the chance of any current religious opinion being in any way compromised in the course of a scientific investigation, this would be a reason for conducting it not in light ephemeral publications, which come into the hands of the careless or ignorant, but in works of a grave and business-like character, answering to the medieval schools of philosophical disputation, which, removed as they were from the region of popular thought and feeling, have, by their vigorous restlessness of inquiry, in spite of their extravagances, done so much for theological precision. I am not, then, supposing the scientific investigator, one, to be coming into collision with dogma, nor, two, venturing by means of his investigations upon any interpretation of scripture, or upon any other conclusion in the matter of religion, nor, three, of his teaching, even in his own science, religious paradoxes, when he should be investigating and proposing, nor, four, of his recklessly scandalising the weak. But these explanations being made, I still say that a scientific speculator or inquirer is not bound, in conducting his researches, to be every moment adjusting his course by the maxims of the schools, or by popular traditions, or by those of any other science distinct from his own, or to be ever narrowly watching what those external sciences have to say to him, 
or to be determined to be edifying, or to be ever answering heretics and unbelievers. Being confident, from the impulse of a generous faith, that, however his line of investigation may swerve now and then, and vary to and fro in its course, or threaten momentary collision or embarrassment with any other department of knowledge, theological or not, yet, if he lets it alone, it will be sure to come home, because truth never can really be contrary to truth, and because often what at first sight is an exceptio may in the event most emphatically probat regulam. This is a point of serious importance to him. Unless he is at liberty to investigate on the basis, and according to the peculiarities of his science, he cannot investigate at all. It is the very law of the human mind in its inquiry after and acquisition of truth to make its advances by a process which consists of many stages and is circuitous. There are no shortcuts to knowledge, nor does the road to it always lie in the direction in which it terminates, nor are we able to see the end on starting. It may often seem to be diverging from a goal into which it will soon run without effort if we are but patient and resolute in following it out. And as we are told in ethics to gain the mean merely by receding from both extremes, so in scientific researches error may be said, without a paradox, to be in some instances the way to truth, and the only way. Moreover, it is not often the fortune of any one man to live through an investigation. The process is one not only of many stages, but of many minds. What one begins, another finishes and a true conclusion is at length worked out by the cooperation of independent schools and the perseverance of successive generations. This being the case, we are obliged under circumstances to bear for a while with what we feel to be error in consideration of the truth in which it is eventually to issue. The analogy of locomotion is most pertinent here. No one can go straight up a mountain. No sailing vessel makes for its port without tacking. And so, applying the illustration, we can indeed, if we will, refuse to allow of investigation or research altogether. But if we invite reason to take its place in our schools, we must let reason have fair and full play. If we reason, we must submit to the conditions of reason. We cannot use it by halves. We must use it as proceeding from him who has also given us revelation and to be ever interrupting its processes and diverting its attention by objections brought from a higher knowledge is parallel to a landsman's dismay at the changes in course of a vessel on which he has deliberately embarked and argues surely some distrust either in the powers of reason on the one hand or the certainty of revealed truth on the other the passenger should not have embarked at all if he did not reckon on the chance of a rough sea of currents of wind and tide of rocks and shoals and we should act more wisely in discountenancing altogether the exercise of reason than in being alarmed and impatient under the suspense, delay and anxiety which, from the nature of the case, may be found to attach to it. Let us eschew secular history and science and philosophy for good and all if we are not allowed to be sure that revelation is so true that the altercations and perplexities of human opinion cannot really or eventually injure its authority. That is no intellectual triumph of any truth of religion which has not been preceded by a full statement of what can be said against it. It is but the ego vapulando illo verborando of the comedy. Great minds need elbow room, not indeed in the domain of faith, but of thought. And so indeed do lesser minds and all minds. There are many persons in the world who are called, and with a great deal of truth, geniuses. They had been gifted by nature with some particular faculty or capacity, and while vehemently excited and imperiously ruled by it, they are blind to everything else. They are enthusiasts in their own line, and are simply dead to the beauty of any line except their own. Accordingly, they think their own line the only line in the whole world worth pursuing, and they feel a sort of contempt for such studies as move upon any other line. Now these men may be, and often are, very good Catholics, and have not a dream of anything but affection and deference towards Catholicity, nay, perhaps are zealous in its interests. Yet, if you insist 
that in their speculations, researches, or conclusions in their particular science, it is not enough that they should submit to the church generally and acknowledge its dogmas, but that they must get up all that divines have said or the multitude believed upon religious matters, you simply crush and stamp out the flame within them, and they can do nothing at all. This is the case of men of genius. Now one word on the contrary, in behalf of masterminds, gifted with a broad philosophical view of things, and a creative power and a versatility capable of accommodating itself to various provinces of thought. These persons, perhaps, like those I have already spoken of, take up some idea and are intent upon it, some deep, prolific, eventful idea which grows upon them till they develop it into a great system. Now, if any such thinker starts from radically unsound principles, or aims at directly false conclusions, if he be a Hobbes, or a Shaftesbury, or a Hume, or a Bentham, then, of course, there is an end to the whole matter. He is an opponent of revealed truth, and he means to be so. Nothing more need be said. But perhaps it is not so. Perhaps his errors are those which are inseparable accidents of his system or of his mind, and are spontaneously evolved, not pertinaciously defended. Every human system, every human writer, is open to just criticism. Make him shut up his portfolio. Good. And then perhaps you lose what, on the whole, and in spite of incidental mistakes, would have been one of the ablest defences of revealed truth, directly or indirectly, according to his subject, ever given to the world. This is how I should account for a circumstance which has sometimes caused surprise that so many great Catholic thinkers have in some points or other incurred the criticism or animadversion of theologians or of ecclesiastical authority. It must be so in the nature of things. There is indeed an animadversion which implies a condemnation of the author, but there is another which means not much more than the P.A. Legendum written against passages in the Fathers. The author may not be to blame, yet the ecclesiastical authority would be to blame if it did not give notice of his imperfections. I do not know what Catholic would not hold the name of Malebranche in veneration. Cardinal Jurdil speaks of his metaphysique as brillante à la vérité, mais non moins solide, and that la liaison qui enchaîne toutes les parties du système philosophique du père Malebranche pourra servir d'apologie à la noble assurance avec laquelle il propose ses sentiments. But he may have accidentally come into collision with theologians, or made temerarious assertions notwithstanding. The practical question is whether he had not much better have written as he has written than not have written at all. And so fully is the Holy See accustomed to enter into this view of the matter that it has allowed of its application not only to philosophical but even to theological and ecclesiastical authors who do not come within the range of these remarks. I believe I am right in saying that in the case of three great names in various departments of learning, Cardinal Norris, Bossuet and Muratori, while not concealing its sense of their having propounded each what might have been said better, nevertheless it has considered that their services to religion were on the whole far too important to allow of their being molested by critical observation in detail. And now, gentlemen, I bring these remarks to a conclusion. What I would urge upon everyone, whatever may be his particular line of research, what I would urge upon men of science in their thoughts of theology, what I would recommend to theologians when their attention is drawn to the subject of scientific investigations is a great and firm belief in the sovereignty of truth. Error may flourish for a time, but truth will prevail in the end. The only effect of error, ultimately, is to promote truth. Theories, speculations, hypotheses are started. Perhaps they are to die. Still, not before they've suggested ideas better than themselves. These better ideas are taken up in turn by other men, and if they do not yet lead to truth, nevertheless they lead to what is still nearer to truth than themselves, and thus knowledge on the whole makes progress. The errors of some minds in scientific investigation are more fruitful than the truths of others. A science seems making no progress but to abound in failures, yet imperceptibly all the time it is advancing and it is, of course, a gain to truth even to have learned what is not true, if nothing more. On the other hand, it must be, of course, remembered, gentlemen, 
that I am supposing all along good faith, honest intentions, a loyal Catholic spirit, and a deep sense of responsibility. I am supposing in the scientific inquirer a due fear of giving scandal, of seeming to countenance views which he does not really countenance, and of siding with parties from whom he heartily differs. I am supposing that he is fully alive to the existence and the power of the infidelity of the age, that he keeps in mind the moral weakness and the intellectual confusion of the majority of men, and that he has no wish at all that any one soul should get harm from certain speculations today, though he may have the satisfaction of being sure that those speculations will, as far as they are erroneous or misunderstood, be corrected in the course of the next half century. End of University Subjects Lecture 8 Recording by Andrew Nash, Abingdon, Oxfordshire, England University Subjects Lecture 9 of The Idea of a University by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 9, Discipline of Mind, an Address to the Evening Classes. When I found that it was in my power to be present here at the commencement of the new session, one of the first thoughts, gentlemen, which thereupon occurred to me was this that I should in consequence have the great satisfaction of meeting you, of whom I had thought and heard so much, and the opportunity of addressing you as rector of the university. I can truly say that I thought of you before you thought of the university, perhaps I may say long before, for it was previously to our commencing that great work which is now so fully before the public, it was when I first came over here to make preparations for it, that I had to encounter the serious objection of wise and good men who said to me, there is no class of persons in Ireland who need a university, and again, whom will you get to belong to it, who will fill its lecture rooms? This was said to me, and then, without denying their knowledge of the state of Ireland or their sagacity, I made answer, we will give lectures in the evening, we will fill our classes with the young men of Dublin. And some persons here may recollect that the very first thing I did when we opened the School of Philosophy and Letters, this time four years ago, was to institute a system of evening lectures, which were suspended after a while only because the singularly inclement season which ensued, and the want of publicity and interest incident to a new undertaking, made them premature. And it is a satisfaction to me to reflect that the statute under which you will be able to pass examinations and take degrees is one to which I specially obtained the consent of the Academical Senate nearly two years ago, in addition to our original regulations, and that you will be the first persons to avail yourselves of it. Having thus prepared, as it were, the university for you, it was with great pleasure that I received from a number of you gentlemen last year a spontaneous request which showed that my original anticipations were not visionary. You suggested then what we have since acted upon, acted upon not so quickly as both you might hope and we might wish, because all important commencements have to be maturely considered, still acted on at length, according to those anticipations of mine to which I have referred. And while I recur to them as an introduction to what I have to say, I might also dwell upon them as a sure presage that other and broader anticipations, too bold as they may seem now, will, if we are but patient, have their fulfilment in due season. For I should not be honest, gentlemen, if I did not confess that, much as I desire that this university should be of service to the young men of Dublin, I do not desire this benefit to you simply for your own sakes. For your own sakes certainly I wish it, but not on your account only. Man is not born for himself alone, as the classical moralist tells us. You are born for Ireland, and in your advancement Ireland is advanced. In your advancement in what is good and what is true, in knowledge, in learning, in cultivation of mind, in enlightened attachment to your religion, in good name and respectability and social influence, I am contemplating the honour and renown, the literary and scientific aggrandizement, the increase of political power of the island of the saints. I go further still. If I do homage to the many virtues and gifts of the Irish people, and am zealous for their full development, it is not simply for the sake of themselves, 
but because the name of Ireland ever has been, and I believe ever will be, associated with the Catholic faith, and because in doing any service, however poor it may be, to Ireland, a man is ministering in his own place and measure to the cause of the Holy Roman Apostolic Church. Gentlemen, I should consider it an impertinence in me thus to be speaking to you of myself, were it not that, in recounting to you the feelings with which I have witnessed the establishment of these evening classes, I am in fact addressing to you at the same time words of encouragement and advice, such words as it becomes a rector to use in speaking to those who are submitted to his care. I say then that, had I been younger than I was when the high office which I at present hold was first offered to me, had I not had prior duties upon me of affection and devotion to the oratory of St. Philip and to my own dear country, no position whatever in the whole range of administrations which are open to the ambition of those who wish to serve God in their generation and to do some great work before they die, would have had more attractions for me than that of being at the head of a university like this. When I became a Catholic, one of my first questions was, why have not our Catholics a university? And Ireland, and the metropolis of Ireland, was obviously the proper seat of such an institution. Ireland is the proper seat of a Catholic university, on account of its ancient hereditary Catholicity, and again, of the future which is in store for it. It is impossible, gentlemen, to doubt that a future is in store for Ireland, for more reasons than can here be enumerated. First, there is the circumstance, so highly suggestive, even if there was nothing else to be said, viz. that the Irish have been so miserably ill-treated and misused hitherto. For in the times now opening upon us, nationalities are waking into life, and the remotest people can make themselves heard into all the quarters of the earth. The lately invented methods of travel and of intelligence have destroyed geographical obstacles, and the wrongs of the oppressed, in spite of oceans or of mountains, are brought under the public opinion of Europe, not before kings and governments alone, but before the tribunal of the European populations, who are becoming ever more powerful in the determination of political questions. And thus retribution is demanded and exacted for past crimes in proportion to their heinousness and their duration. And in the next place, it is plain that, according as intercommunion grows between Europe and America, it is Ireland that must grow with it in social and political importance. For Ireland is the high road by which that intercourse is carried on, and the traffic between hemispheres must be to her a source of material as well as social benefit, as of old time, though on the minute geographical scale of Greece, Corinth, as being the thoroughfare of commerce by sea and land, became and was called the rich. And then again, we must consider the material resources of Ireland, so insufficiently explored, so poorly developed, of which it belongs to them rather to speak who by profession and attainment are masters of the subject. That this momentous future, thus foreshadowed, will be as glorious for Catholicity as for Ireland, we cannot doubt from the experience of the past. But, as providence works by means of human agencies, that natural anticipation has no tendency to diminish the anxiety and earnestness of all zealous Catholics to do their part in securing its fulfilment, and the wise and diligent cultivation of the intellect is one principal means, under the divine blessing, of the desired result. Gentlemen, the seat of this intellectual progress must necessarily be the great towns of Ireland, and those great towns have a remarkable and happy characteristic as contrasted with the cities of Catholic Europe. Abroad, even in Catholic countries, if there be in any part of their territory scepticism and insubordination in religion, cities are the seat of the mischief. Even Rome itself has its insubordinate population and its concealed free thinkers. Even Belgium, that nobly Catholic country, cannot boast of the religious loyalty of its great towns. Such a calamity is unknown to the Catholicism of Dublin, Cork, Belfast, and the other cities of Ireland. For, to say nothing of higher and more religious causes of the difference, the very presence of a rival religion is a perpetual incentive to faith and devotion in men who, from the circumstances of the case, would be in danger of becoming worse than lax Catholics, unless they resolved on being zealous ones. Here, then, is one remarkable ground of promise in the future of Ireland, 
that that large and important class, members of which I am now addressing, that the middle class in its cities, which will be the depositaries of its increasing political power, and which elsewhere are opposed in their hearts to the Catholicism which they profess, are here so sound in faith, and so exemplary in devotional exercises, and in works of piety. And next I would observe that, while thus distinguished for religious earnestness, the Catholic population is in no respect degenerate from the ancient fame of Ireland as regards its intellectual endowments. It too often happens that the religiously disposed are in the same degree intellectually deficient. But the Irish ever have been, as their worst enemies must grant, not only a Catholic people, but a people of great natural abilities, keen-witted, original and subtle. This has been the characteristic of the nation from the very early times, and was especially prominent in the Middle Ages. As Rome was the centre of authority, so I may say Ireland was the native home of speculation. In this respect, they were as remarkably contrasted to the English as they are now, though in those days England was as devoted to the Holy See as it is now hostile. The Englishman was hard-working, plodding, bold, determined, persevering, practical, obedient to law and precedent, and, if he cultivated his mind, he was literary and classical rather than scientific, for literature involves in it the idea of authority and prescription. On the other hand, in Ireland the intellect seems rather to have taken the line of science, and we have various instances to show how fully this was recognised in those times, and with what success it was carried out. Philosopher is in those times almost the name for an Irish monk. Both in Paris and Oxford, the two great schools of medieval thought, we find the boldest and most subtle of their disputants, an Irishman. The monk, John Scotus Erigena, at Paris, and Duns Scotus, the Franciscan friar, at Oxford. Now it is my belief, gentlemen, that this character of mind remains in you still. I think I rightly recognise in the Irishman now, as formerly, the curious, inquisitive observer, the acute reasoner, the subtle speculator. I recognise in you talents which are fearfully mischievous when used on the side of error, but which, when wielded by Catholic devotion, such as I am sure will ever be the characteristic of the Irish disputant, are of the highest importance to Catholic interests, and especially at this day, when a subtle logic is used against the Church and demands a logic still more subtle on the part of her defenders to expose it. Gentlemen, I do not expect those who, like you, are employed in your secular callings, who are not monks or friars, not priests, not theologians, not philosophers, to come forward as champions of the faith. But I think that incalculable benefit may ensue to the Catholic cause, greater almost than that which even singularly gifted theologians or controversialists could effect, if a body of men in your station of life shall be found in the great towns of Ireland, not disputatious, contentious, loquacious, presumptuous, of course, I am not advocating inquiry for mere argument's sake, but gravely and solidly educated in Catholic knowledge, intelligent, acute, versed in their religion, sensitive of its beauty and majesty, alive to the arguments in its behalf, and aware both of its difficulties and of the mode of treating them. And the first step in attaining this desirable end is that you should submit yourselves to a curriculum of studies, such as that which brings you with such praiseworthy diligence within these halls evening after evening. And though you may not be giving attention to them with this view, but from the laudable love of knowledge, or for the advantages which will accrue to you personally from its pursuit, Yet my own reason for rejoicing in the establishment of your classes is the same as that which led me to take part in the establishment of the university itself, viz. the wish, by increasing the intellectual force of Ireland, to strengthen the defences, in a day of great danger, of the Christian religion. Gentlemen, within the last thirty years there has been, as you know, a great movement in behalf of the extension of knowledge among those classes in society whom you represent. This movement has issued in the establishment of what have been called mechanics institutes through the United Kingdom, and a new species of literature has been brought into existence, with a view, among its objects, of furnishing the members of these institutions with interesting and instructive reading. 
I never will deny to that literature its due praise. It has been the production of men of the highest ability and the most distinguished station, who have not grudged, moreover, the trouble and, I may say in a certain sense, the condescension of presenting themselves before the classes for whose intellectual advancement they were showing so laudable a zeal, who have not grudged, in the cause of literature, history, or science, to make a display, in the lecture-room or the public hall, of that eloquence which was, strictly speaking, the property, as I may call it, of Parliament, or of the august tribunals of the law. Nor will I deny to the speaking and writing to which I am referring the merit of success, as well as that of talent and good intention, so far as this, that it has provided a fund of innocent amusement and information for the leisure hours of those who might otherwise have been exposed to the temptation of corrupt reading or bad company. So much may be granted, and must be granted in candour. But when I go on to ask myself the question, what permanent advantage the mind gets by such desultory reading and hearing as this literary movement encourages, then I find myself altogether in a new field of thought, and am obliged to return an answer less favourable than I could wish to those who are the advocates of it. We must carefully distinguish, gentlemen, between the mere diversion of the mind and its real education. Supposing, for instance, I am tempted to go into some society which will do me harm, and supposing instead I fall asleep in my chair, and so let the time pass by, in that case certainly I escape the danger. But it is as if by accident, and my going to sleep has not had any real effect upon me, or made me more able to resist the temptation on some future occasion. I wake, and I am what I was before. The opportune sleep has but removed the temptation for this once. It has not made me better, for I have not been shielded from temptation by any act of my own. But I was passive under an accident, for such I may call sleep. And so in like manner, if I hear a lecture indolently and passively, I cannot indeed be elsewhere while I am hearing it, but it produces no positive effect on my mind. It does not tend to create any power in my breast capable of resisting temptation by its own vigour, should temptation come a second time. Now this is no fault, gentlemen, of the books or the lectures of the Mechanics Institute. They could not do more than they do from their very nature. They do their part, but their part is not enough. A man may hear a thousand lectures, and read a thousand volumes, and be at the end of the process very much where he was as regards knowledge. Something more than merely admitting it in a negative way into the mind is necessary, if it is to remain there. It must not be passively received, but actually and actively entered into, embraced, mastered. The mind must go halfway to meet what comes to it from without. This, then, is the point in which the institutions I am speaking of fail. Here, on the contrary, is the advantage of such lectures as you are attending, gentlemen, in our university. You have come not merely to be taught, but to learn. You have come to exert your minds. You have come to make what you hear your own, by putting out your hand, as it were, to grasp it and appropriate it. You do not come merely to hear a lecture or to read a book but you come for that catechetical instruction which consists in a sort of conversation between your lecturer and you. He tells you a thing, and he asks you to repeat it after him. He questions you, he examines you, he will not let you go till he has proof, not only that you have heard, but that you know. Gentlemen, I am induced to quote here some remarks of my own, which I put into print on occasion of those evening lectures already referred to, with which we introduced the first terms of the university. The attendance upon them was not large, and in consequence we discontinued them for a time, but I attempted to explain in print what the object of them had been, and while what I said then is pertinent to the subject I am now pursuing, it will be an evidence too, in addition to my opening remarks, of the hold which the idea of these evening lectures has had upon me. I will venture to give you my thoughts, I then said, writing to a friend, on the object of the evening public lectures lately delivered in the university house, which I think has been misunderstood. I can bear witness not only to their remarkable merit as lectures, but also to the fact that they were very satisfactorily attended. Many, however, attach a vague or unreasonable idea to the word satisfactory, and maintain that no lectures can be called satisfactory, 
which do not make a great deal of noise in the place, and they are disappointed otherwise. This is what I mean by misconceiving their object, for such an expectation and consequent regret arise from confusing the ordinary with the extraordinary object of a lecture, upon which point we ought to have clear and definite ideas. The ordinary object of lectures is to teach, but there is an object sometimes demanding attention and not incongruous, which nevertheless cannot be said properly to belong to them or to be more than occasional. As there are kinds of eloquence which do not aim at anything beyond their own exhibition, and are content with being eloquent, and with the sensation which eloquence creates, so in schools and universities there are seasons, festive or solemn, anyway extraordinary, when academical acts are not directed towards their proper ends, so much as intended to amuse, to astonish, and to attract, and thus to have an effect upon public opinion. Such are the exhibition days of colleges such the annual commemoration of benefactors at one of the English universities, when doctors put on their gayest gowns and public orators make Latin speeches. Such, too, are the terminal lectures at which divines of the greatest reputation for intellect and learning have before now poured forth sentences of burning eloquence into the ears of an audience brought together for the very sake of the display. The object of all such lectures and orations is to excite or to keep up an interest and reverence in the public mind for the institutions from which the exhibition proceeds. I might have added, such are the lectures delivered by celebrated persons in the Mechanics Institutes. I continue. Such we have suitably had in the new university. Such were the inaugural lectures. Displays of strength and skill of this kind, in order to succeed, should attract attention and if they do not attract attention, they have failed. They do not invite an audience, but an attendance, and perhaps it is hardly too much to say that they are intended for seeing rather than for hearing. Such celebrations, however, from the nature of the case, must be rare. It is the novelty which brings, it is the excitement which recompenses the assemblage. The academical body which attempts to make such extraordinary acts the normal condition of its proceedings is putting itself and its professors in a false position. It is then a simple misconception to suppose that those to whom the government of our university is confided have aimed at an object which could not be contemplated at all without a confusion or inadvertence, such as no considerate person will impute to them. Public lectures delivered with such an object could not be successful, and in consequence our late lectures have, I cannot doubt, for it could not be otherwise, ended unsatisfactorily in the judgment of any zealous person who has assumed for them an office with which their projectors never invested them. What their object really was, the very meaning of academical institutions suggests to us. It is, as I said when I began, to teach. Lectures are, properly speaking, not exhibitions or exercises of art, but matters of business. They profess to impart something definite to those who attend them, and those who attend them profess on their part to receive what the lecturer has to offer. It is a case of contract. I will speak if you will listen. I will come here to learn if you have anything worth teaching me. In an oratorical display, all the effort is on one side. In a lecture, it is shared between two parties who cooperate towards a common end. There should ever be something, on the face of the arrangements, to act as a memento that those who come, come to gain something, and not from mere curiosity. And in matters of fact, such were the persons who did attend, in the course of last term, and such as those and no others will attend. Those came who wished to gain information on a subject new to them, from informants whom they held in consideration, and regarded as authorities. It was impossible to survey the audience which occupied the lecture room without seeing that they came on what may be called business. And this is why I said, when I began, that the attendance was satisfactory. That attendance is satisfactory, not which is numerous, but which is steady and persevering. But it is plain that to a mere bystander, who came merely from general interest or good will to see how things were going on, and who did not catch the object of advertising the lectures, it would not occur to look into the faces of the audience. He would think it enough to be counting their heads. 
he would do little more than observe whether the staircase and landing were full of loungers, and whether there was such a noise and bustle that it was impossible to hear a word, and if he could get in and out of the room without an effort, if he could sit at his ease and actually hear the lecturer, he would think he had sufficient grounds for considering the attendance unsatisfactory. The stimulating system may easily be overdone, and does not answer in the long run. A blaze among the stubble, and then all is dark. I have seen in my time various instances of the way in which lectures really gain upon the public, and I must express my opinion that, even were it the sole object of our great undertaking to make a general impression upon public opinion, instead of that of doing definite good to definite persons, I should reject that method, which the university indeed itself has not taken, but which young and ardent minds may have thought the more promising. Even did I wish merely to get the intellect of all Dublin into our rooms, I should not dream of doing it all at once, but at length. I should not rely on sudden, startling efforts, but on the slow, silent, penetrating, overpowering effects of patience, steadiness, routine, and perseverance. I have known individuals set themselves down in a neighbourhood where they had no advantages, and in a place where they had no pretensions, and upon a work which had little or nothing of authoritative sanction, and they have gone on steadily lecturing week after week, with little encouragement, but much resolution. For months they were ill-attended, and overlooked in the bustle of the world around them. But there was a secret, gradual movement going on, and a specific force of attraction, and a drifting and accumulation of hearers, which at length made itself felt, and could not be mistaken. In this stage of things, a friend said in conversation to me, when at the moment I knew nothing of the parties, By the by, if you are interested in such and such a subject, go by all means and hear such a one. So-and-so does, and says there is no one like him. I looked in myself the other night, and was very much struck. Do go, you can't mistake. He lectures every Tuesday night, or Wednesday, or Thursday, as it might be. An influence thus gradually acquired endures, Sudden popularity dies away as suddenly. As regards ourselves, the time is past now, gentlemen, for such modesty of expectation and such caution in encouragement as these last sentences exhibit. The few but diligent attendants upon the professor's lectures with whom we began have grown into the diligent and zealous many, and the speedy fulfilment of anticipations which then seemed to be hazardous surely is a call on us to cherish bolder hopes and to form more extended plans for the years which are to follow. You will ask me, perhaps, after these general remarks, to suggest to you the particular intellectual benefit which I conceive students have a right to require of us, and which we engage, by means of our evening classes, to provide for them. And in order to do this, you must allow me to make use of an illustration which I have heretofore employed, and which I repeat here, because it is the best I can find to convey what I wish to impress upon you. It is an illustration which includes in its application all of us, teachers as well as taught, though it applies, of course, to some more than to others, and to those especially who come for instruction. I consider, then, that the position of our minds, as far as they are uncultivated, towards intellectual objects, I mean of our minds before they have been disciplined and formed by the action of our reason upon them, is analogous to that of a blind man towards the objects of vision, at the moment when eyes are for the first time given to him by the skill of the operator. Then the multitude of things which present themselves to the sight under a multiplicity of shapes and hues pour in upon him from the external world all at once, and are at first nothing else but lines and colours without mutual connection, dependence or contrast, without order or principle, without drift or meaning, and like the wrong side of a piece of tapestry or carpet. By degrees, by the sense of touch, by reaching out the hands, by walking into this maze of colours, by turning round in it, by accepting the principle of perspective, by the various slow teaching of experience, the first information of the sight is corrected, and what was an unintelligible wilderness becomes a landscape or a scene, and is understood to consist of space, and of bodies variously located in space, with such consequences as thence necessarily follow. The knowledge is at length gained of things or objects, and of their relation to each other, 
and it is a kind of knowledge, as is plain, which is forced upon us all from infancy, as to the blind on their first seeing, by the testimony of our other senses, and by the very necessity of supporting life, so that even the brute animals have been gifted with the faculty of acquiring it. Such is the case as regards material objects, and it is much the same as regards intellectual. I mean that there is a vast host of matters of all kinds which address themselves not to the eye, but to our mental sense, viz. all those matters of thought which in the course of life and the intercourse of society are brought before us, which we hear of in conversation, which we read of in books, matters political, social, ecclesiastical, literary, domestic, persons and their doings or their writings, events and works and undertakings and laws and institutions. These make up a much more subtle and intricate world than that visible universe of which I was just now speaking. It is much more difficult in this world than in the material to separate things off from each other, and to find out how they stand related to each other, and to learn how to class them and where to locate them respectively. Still, it is not less true that, as the various figures and forms in a landscape have each its own place, and stand in this or that direction towards each other, so all the various objects which address the intellect have severally a substance of their own, and have fixed relations each of them with everything else, relations which our minds have no power of creating, but which we are obliged to ascertain before we have a right to boast that we really know anything about them. Yet when the mind looks out for the first time into this manifold spiritual world, it is just as much confused and dazzled and distracted as are the eyes of the blind when they first begin to see. And it is by a long process, and with much effort and anxiety, that we begin hardly and partially to apprehend its various contents and to put each in its proper place. We grow up from boyhood, our minds open, we go into the world, we hear what men say or read what they put in print, and thus a profusion of matters of all kinds is discharged upon us. Some sort of an idea we have of most of them from hearing what others say, but it is a very vague idea, probably a mistaken idea. Young people, especially because they are young, colour the assemblage of persons and things which they encounter with the freshness and grace of their own springtide, look for all good from the reflection of their own hopefulness, and worship what they have created. Men of ambition, again, look upon the world as a theatre for fame and glory, and make it that magnificent scene of high enterprise and august recompense which Pindar or Cicero has delineated. Poets, too, after their wont, put their ideal interpretation upon all things, material as well as moral, and substitute the noble for the true. Here are various obvious instances, suggestive of the discipline which is imperative if the mind is to grasp things as they are, and to discriminate substances from shadows. For I am not concerned merely with youth, ambition, or poetry, but with our mental condition generally. It is the fault of all of us, till we have duly practised our minds, to be unreal in our sentiments, and crude in our judgments, and to be carried off by fancies, instead of being at the trouble of acquiring sound knowledge. In consequence, when we hear opinions put forth on any new subject, we have no principle to guide us in balancing them. We do not know what to make of them. We turn them to and fro, and over and back again, as if to pronounce upon them if we could, but with no means of pronouncing. It is the same when we attempt to speak upon them. We make some random venture, or we take up the opinion of someone else, which strikes our fancy, or perhaps, with the vaguest enunciation possible of any opinion at all, we are satisfied with ourselves if we are merely able to throw off some rounded sentences, to make some pointed remarks on some other subject, or to introduce some figure of speech, or flowers of rhetoric, which, instead of being the vehicle, are the mere substitute of meaning. We wish to take a part in politics, and then nothing is open to us but to follow some person or some party, and to learn the commonplaces and the watchwords which belong to it. We hear about landed interests, and mercantile interests, and trade, and higher and lower classes, and their rights, duties, and prerogatives, and we attempt to transmit what we have received, and soon our minds become loaded and perplexed by the encumbrance of ideas which we have not mastered and cannot use. We have some vague idea, for instance, that constitutional government and slavery are inconsistent with each other, 
that there is a connection between private judgment and democracy, between Christianity and civilization. We attempt to find arguments in proof, and our arguments are the most plain demonstration that we simply do not understand the things themselves of which we are professedly treating. Reflect, gentlemen, how many disputes you must have listened to which were interminable because neither party understood either his opponent or himself. Consider the fortunes of an argument in a debating society, and the need there so frequently is not simply of some clear thinker to disentangle the perplexities of thought, but of capacity in the combatants to do justice to the clearest explanations which are set before them. So much so, that the luminous arbitration only gives rise, perhaps, to more hopeless altercation. Is a constitutional government better for a population than an absolute rule? What a number of points have to be clearly apprehended before we are in a position to say one word on such a question. What is meant by constitution, by constitutional government, by better, by a population, and by absolutism? The ideas represented by these various words ought, I do not say to be as perfectly defined and located in the minds of the speakers as objects of sight in a landscape, but to be sufficiently, even though incompletely, apprehended before they have a right to speak. How is it that democracy can admit of slavery as in ancient Greece? How can Catholicism flourish in a republic? Now, a person who knows his ignorance will say, these questions are beyond me, and he tries to gain a clear notion and a firm hold of them, and if he speaks, it is as investigating, not as deciding. On the other hand, let him never have tried to throw things together, or to discriminate between them, or to denote their peculiarities. In that case, he has no hesitation in undertaking any subject, and perhaps has most to say upon those questions which are most new to him. This is why so many men are one-sided, narrow-minded, prejudiced, crotchety. This is why able men have to change their minds and their line of action in middle age and to begin life again, because they have followed their party instead of having secured that faculty of true perception as regards intellectual objects which have accrued to them without their knowing how, as regards the objects of sight. But this defect will never be corrected. On the contrary, it will be aggravated by those popular institutions to which I have referred just now the displays of eloquence or the interesting matter contained in their lectures, the variety of useful or entertaining knowledge contained in their libraries, though admirable in themselves and advantageous to the student at a later stage of his course, can never serve as a substitute for methodical and laborious teaching. A young man of sharp and active intellect who has had no other training has little to show for it besides a litter of ideas heaped up into his mind anyhow. He can utter a number of truths or sophisms, as the case may be, and one is as good to him as another. He is up with a number of doctrines and a number of facts, but they are all loose and straggling, for he has no principles set up in his mind round which to aggregate and locate them. He can say a word or two on half a dozen sciences, but not a dozen words on any one. He says one thing now and another thing presently and when he attempts to write down distinctly what he holds upon a point in dispute, or what he understands by its terms, he breaks down and is surprised at his failure. He sees objections more clearly than truths, and can ask a thousand questions which the wisest of men cannot answer, and withal he has a very good opinion of himself, and is well satisfied with his attainments, and he declares against others, as opposed to the spread of knowledge altogether, who do not happen to adopt his ways of furthering it, or the opinions in which he considers it to result. This is that barren mockery of knowledge which comes of attending on great lecturers, or of mere acquaintance with reviews, magazines, newspapers, and other literature of the day, which, however able and valuable in itself, is not the instrument of intellectual education. If this is all the training a man has, the chance is that when a few years have passed over his head and he has talked to the full, he wearies of talking and of the subjects on which he talked. He gives up the pursuit of knowledge and forgets what he knew, whatever it was. And taking things at their best, his mind is in no very different condition from what it was when he first began to improve it, as he hoped, though perhaps he never thought of more than of amusing himself. I say, at the best, 
for perhaps he will suffer from exhaustion and a distaste of the subjects which once pleased him, or perhaps he has suffered some real intellectual mischief, perhaps he has contracted some serious disorder, he has admitted some taint of scepticism which he will never get rid of. And here we see what is meant by the poet's maxim, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Not that knowledge, little or much, if it be real knowledge, is dangerous, but that many a man considers a mere hazy view of many things to be real knowledge, whereas it does but mislead, just as a short-sighted man sees only so far as to be led by his uncertain sight over the precipice. Such, then, being true cultivation of mind, and such the literary institutions which do not tend to it, I might proceed to show you, gentlemen, did time admit, how, on the other hand, that kind of instruction of which our evening classes are a specimen is especially suited to effect what they propose. Consider, for instance, what a discipline in accuracy of thought it is to have to construe a foreign language into your own, what a still severer and more improving exercise it is to translate from your own into a foreign language. Consider again what a lesson in memory and discrimination it is to get up, as it is called, any one chapter of history. Consider what a trial of acuteness, caution and exactness it is to master, and still more to prove, a number of definitions. Again, what an exercise in logic is classification. What an exercise in logical precision it is to understand and enunciate the proof of any of the more difficult propositions of Euclid or to master any one of the great arguments for Christianity so thoroughly as to bear examination upon it, or again, to analyse sufficiently, yet in as few words as possible, a speech, or to draw up a critique upon a poem, and so of any other science, chemistry, or comparative anatomy, or natural history. It does not matter what it is, if it be really studied and mastered as far as it is taken up. The result is a formation of mind, that is, a habit of order and system, a habit of referring every accession of knowledge to what we already know, and of adjusting the one with the other, and moreover, as such a habit implies, the actual acceptance and use of certain principles as centres of thought around which our knowledge grows and is located. Where this critical faculty exists, history is no longer a mere storybook, or biography a romance. Orators and publications of the day are no longer infallible authorities. Eloquent diction is no longer a substitute for matter, nor bold statements or lively descriptions a substitute for proof. This is that faculty of perception in intellectual matters which, as I have said so often, is analogous to the capacity we all have of mastering the multitude of lines and colours which pour in upon our eyes, and of deciding what every one of them is worth. But I should be transgressing the limits assigned to an address of this nature were I to proceed. I have not said anything, gentlemen, on the religious duties which become the members of a Catholic university, because we are directly concerned here with your studies only. It is my consolation to know that so many of you belong to a society or association which the zeal of some excellent priests, one especially, has been so instrumental in establishing in your great towns. You do not come to us to have the foundation laid in your breasts of that knowledge which is the highest of all. It has been laid already. You have begun your mental training with faith and devotion, and then you come to us to add the education of the intellect to the education of the heart. Go on as you have begun, and you will be one of the proudest achievements of our great undertaking. We shall be able to point to you in proof that zeal for knowledge may thrive even under the pressure of secular callings. That mother wit does not necessarily make a man idle, nor inquisitiveness of mind irreverent. That shrewdness and cleverness are not incompatible with firm faith in the mysteries of revelation. That attainment in literature and science need not make men conceited, nor above their station, nor restless, nor self-willed. We shall be able to point to you in proof of the power of Catholicism to make out of the staple of great towns exemplary and enlightened Christians of those classes which, external to Ireland, are the problem and perplexity of patriotic statesmen, and the natural opponents of the teachers of every kind of religion. As to myself, I wish I could, by actual service and hard work of my own, respond to your zeal, as so many of my dear and excellent friends, the professors of the university, have done and do. 
They have a merit. They have a claim on you, gentlemen, in which I have no part. If I admire the energy and bravery with which you have undertaken the work of self-improvement, be sure I do not forget their public spirit and noble free devotion to the university any more than you do. I know I should not satisfy you with any praise of this supplement of our academical arrangements, which did not include those who give to it its life. It is a very pleasing and encouraging sight to see both parties, the teachers and the taught, cooperating with a pure esprit de corps thus voluntarily, they as fully as you can do, for a great object. And I offer up my earnest prayers to the author of all good, that he will ever bestow on you all, on professors and on students, as I feel sure he will bestow, rulers and superiors who, by their zeal and diligence in their own place, shall prove themselves worthy both of your cause and of yourselves. End of University Subjects Lecture 9 Recording by Andrew Nash, Abingdon, Oxfordshire, England University Subjects Lecture 10 of The Idea of a University by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Lecture 10, Christianity and Medical Science, an Address to the Students of Medicine. I have had so few opportunities, gentlemen, of addressing you, and our present meeting is of so interesting and pleasing a character, by reason of the object which occasions it, that I am encouraged to speak freely to you, though I do not know you personally, on a subject which, as you may conceive, is often before my own mind. I mean the exact relation in which your noble profession stands towards the Catholic University itself, and towards Catholicism generally. Considering my own most responsible office as rector, my vocation as an ecclesiastic, and then again my years, which increase my present claim, and diminish my future chances of speaking to you, I need make no apology, I am sure, for a step which will be recommended to you by my good intentions, even though it deserves no consideration on the score of the reflections and suggestions themselves which I shall bring before you. If indeed this university, and its faculty of medicine inclusively, were set up for the promotion of any merely secular object, in the spirit of religious rivalry, as a measure of party politics, or as a commercial speculation, then indeed I should be out of place, not only in addressing you in the tone of advice, but in being here at all. For what reason could I, in that case, have had, for having now given some of the most valuable years of my life to this university, for having placed it foremost in my thoughts and anxieties, I had well nigh said, to the prejudice of prior, dearer, and more sacred ties, except that I felt that the highest and most special religious interests were bound up in its establishment and in its success. Suffer me, then, gentlemen, if with these views and feelings I conform my observations to the sacred building in which we find ourselves, and if I speak to you for a few minutes as if I were rather addressing you authoritatively from the pulpit than in the rector's chair. Now I am going to set before you, in as few words as I can, what I conceive to be the principal duty of the medical profession towards religion, and some of the difficulties which are found in the observance of that duty. And in speaking on the subject, I am conscious how little qualified I am to handle it in such a way as will come home to your minds, from that want of acquaintance with you personally, to which I have alluded, and from my necessary ignorance of the influences of whatever kind which actually surround you, and the points of detail which are likely to be your religious embarrassments. I can but lay down principles and maxims which you must apply for yourselves, and which in some respects or cases you may feel have no true application at all. All professions have their dangers, all general truths have their fallacies, all spheres of action have their limits, and are liable to improper extension or alteration. Every professional man has rightly a zeal for his profession, and he would not do his duty towards it without that zeal. And that zeal soon becomes exclusive, or rather necessarily involves a sort of exclusiveness. 
A zealous professional man soon comes to think that his profession is all in all, and that the world would not go on without it. We have heard, for instance, a great deal lately, in regard to the war in India, of political views suggesting one plan of campaign, and military views suggesting another. How hard it must be for the military man to forego his own strategical dispositions, not on the ground that they are not the best, not that they are not acknowledged by those who nevertheless put them aside to be the best for the object of military success, but because military success is not the highest of objects and the end of ends, because it is not the sovereign science, but must ever be subordinate to political considerations or maxims of government, which is a higher science with higher objects, and that therefore his sure success on the field must be relinquished because the interests of the council and the cabinet require the sacrifice, that the war must yield to the statesman's craft, the commander-in-chief to the governor-general. Yet what the soldier feels is natural, and what the statesman does is just. This collision, this desire on the part of every profession to be supreme, this necessary though reluctant subordination of the one to the other, is a process ever going on, ever acted out before our eyes. The civilian is in rivalry with the soldier, the soldier with the civilian. The diplomatist, the lawyer, the political economist, the merchant, each wishes to usurp the powers of the state and to mould society upon the principles of his own pursuit. Nor do they confine themselves to the mere province of secular matters. They intrude into the province of religion. In England, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, lawyers got hold of religion and never have let it go. Abroad, bureaucracy keeps hold of religion with a more or less firm grasp. The circles of literature and science have in like manner before now made religion a mere province of their universal empire. I remark, moreover, that these various usurpations are frequently made in perfectly good faith. There is no intention of encroachment on the part of the encroachers. The commander recommends what, with all his heart and soul, he thinks best for his country when he presses on government a certain plan of campaign. The political economist has the most honest intentions of improving the Christian system of social duty by his reforms. The statesman may have the best and most loyal dispositions towards the Holy See, at the time, he is urging changes in ecclesiastical discipline which would be seriously detrimental to the church. And now I will say how this applies to the medical profession, and what is its special danger viewed in relation to Catholicity. Its province is the physical nature of man, and its object is the preservation of that physical nature in its proper state, and its restoration when it has lost it. It limits itself, by its very profession, to the health of the body. It ascertains the conditions of that health. It analyses the causes of its interruption or failure. It seeks about for the means of cure. But, after all, bodily health is not the only end of man, and the medical science is not the highest science of which he is the subject. Man has a moral and a religious nature as well as a physical. He has a mind and a soul and the mind and soul have a legitimate sovereignty over the body, and the sciences relating to them have in consequence the precedence of those sciences which relate to the body. And as the soldier must yield to the statesman when they come into collision with each other, so must the medical man to the priest. Not that the medical man may not be enunciating what is absolutely certain in a medical point of view, as the commander may be perfectly right in what he enunciates strategically, but that his action is suspended in the given case by the interests and duty of a superior science, and he retires not confuted, but superseded. Now this general principle thus stated all will admit. Who will deny that health must give way to duty? So far there is no perplexity. Supposing a fever to break out in a certain place, and the medical practitioner said to a sister of charity who was visiting the sick there, You will die to a certainty if you remain there. 
and her ecclesiastical superiors, on the contrary, said, You have devoted your life to such services, and there you must stay. And supposing she stayed, and was taken off. The medical adviser would be right. But who would say that the religious sister was wrong? She did not doubt his word, but she denied the importance of that word compared with the word of her religious superiors. The medical man was right, yet he could not gain his point. He was right in what he said, he said what was true, yet he had to give way. Here we are approaching what I conceive to be the especial temptation and danger to which the medical profession is exposed. It is a certain sophism of the intellect founded on this maxim, implied, but not spoken or even recognised, what is true is lawful. Not so. Observe, here is the fallacy. What is true in one science is dictated to us indeed according to that science, but not according to another science or in another department. What is certain in the military art has force in the military art, but not in statesmanship. And if statesmanship be a higher department of action than war, and enjoins the contrary, it has no claim on our reception and obedience at all. And so what is true in medical science might in all cases be carried out, were man a mere animal, or brute without a soul. But since he is a rational, responsible being, a thing may be ever so true in medicine, yet may be unlawful in fact in consequence of the higher law of morals and religion having come to some different conclusion. Now I must be allowed some few words to express, or rather to suggest, more fully what I mean. The whole universe comes from the good God. It is his creation. It is good. It is all good, as being the work of the good, though good only in its degree, and not after his infinite perfection. The physical nature of man is good, nor can there be anything sinful in itself in acting according to that nature. Every natural appetite or function is lawful, speaking abstractedly. No natural feeling or act is in itself sinful. There can be no doubt of all this, and there can be no doubt that science can determine what is natural, what tends to the preservation of a healthy state of nature, and what, on the contrary, is injurious to nature. Thus the medical student has a vast field of knowledge spread out before him, true because knowledge, and innocent because true. So much in the abstract. But when we come to fact, it may easily happen that what is in itself innocent may not be innocent to this or that person in this or that mode or degree. Again, it may easily happen that the impressions made on a man's mind by his own science may be indefinitely more vivid and operative than the enunciations of truth belonging to some other branch of knowledge, which indeed strike his ear, but do not come home to him, are not fixed in his memory, are not imprinted on his imagination. And in the profession before us, a medical student may realise far more powerfully and habitually that certain acts are advisable in themselves, according to the law of physical nature, than the fact that they are forbidden according to the law of some higher science, as theology, or again, that they are accidentally wrong, as being, though lawful in themselves, wrong in this or that individual, or under the circumstances of the case. Now to recur to the instance I have already given. It is supposable that the Sister of Charity, who for the sake of her soul would not obey the law of self-preservation as regards her body, might cause her medical adviser great irritation and disgust. His own particular profession might have so engrossed his mind, and the truth of its maxims have so penetrated it, that he could not understand or admit any other or higher system. He might, in process of time, have become simply dead to all religious truths, because such truths were not present to him, and those of his own science were ever present. And observe, his fault would be not that of taking error for truth, for what he relied on was truth, but in not understanding that there were other truths, and those higher than his own. Take another case, in which there will often, in particular circumstances, be considerable differences of opinion among really religious men, 
but which does not cease on that account to illustrate the point I am insisting on. A patient is dying. The priest wishes to be introduced, lest he should die without due preparation. The medical man says that the thought of religion will disturb his mind and imperil his recovery. Now, in the particular case, the one party or the other may be right in urging his own view of what ought to be done. I am merely directing attention to the principle involved in it. Here are the representatives of two great sciences, religion and medicine. Each says what is true in his own science. Each will think he has a right to insist on seeing that the truth which he himself is maintaining is carried out in action. Whereas one of the two sciences is above the other, and the end of religion is indefinitely higher than the end of medicine. And however the decision ought to go, in the particular case, as to introducing the subject of religion or not, I think the priest ought to have that decision, just as a governor-general, not a commander-in-chief, would have the ultimate decision were politics and strategics to come into collision. You will easily understand, gentlemen, that I dare not pursue my subject into those details which are of the greater importance for the very reason that they cannot be spoken of. A medical philosopher who has so simply fixed his intellect on his own science as to have forgotten the existence of any other will view man who is the subject of his contemplation as a being who has little more to do than to be born, to grow, to eat, to drink, to walk, to reproduce his kind, and to die. He sees him born as other animals are born. He sees life leave him, with all those phenomena of annihilation which accompany the death of a brute. He compares his structure, his organs, his functions, with those of other animals, and his own range of science leads to the discovery of no facts which are sufficient to convince him that there is any difference in kind between the human animal and them. His practice, then, is according to his facts and his theory. Such a person will think himself free to give advice and to insist upon rules which are quite insufferable to any religious mind, and simply antagonistic to faith and morals. It is not, I repeat, that he says what is untrue, supposing that man were an animal and nothing else, but he thinks that whatever is true in his own science is at once lawful in practice, as if there were not a number of rival sciences in the great circle of philosophy, as if there were not a number of conflicting views and objects in human nature to be taken into account and reconciled, or as if it were his duty to forget all but his own. whereas. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. I have known in England the most detestable advice given to young persons by eminent physicians in consequence of this contracted view of man and his destinies. God forbid that I should measure the professional habits of Catholics by the rules of practice of those who were not. But it is plain that what is actually carried out where religion is not known exists as a temptation and a danger in the science of medicine itself, where religion is known ever so well. And now, having suggested, as far as I dare, what I consider the consequences of that radical sophism to which the medical profession is exposed, let me go on to say in what way it is corrected by the action of Catholicism upon it. You will observe, then, gentlemen, that those higher sciences of which I have spoken morals and religion, are not represented to the intelligence of the world by intimations and notices strong and obvious, such as those which are the foundation of physical science. The physical nature lies before us, patent to the sight, ready to the touch, appealing to the senses, in so unequivocal a way that the science which is founded upon it is as real to us as the fact of our personal existence. But the phenomena which are the basis of morals and religion have nothing of this luminous evidence. Instead of being obtruded upon our notice so that we cannot possibly overlook them, they are the dictates either of conscience or of faith. They are faint shadows and tracings, certain indeed, but delicate, fragile, and almost evanescent, which the mind recognises at one time, not at another, discerns when it is calm, loses when it is in agitation. 
The reflection of sky and mountains in the lake is a proof that sky and mountains are around it. But the twilight, or the mist, or the sudden storm hurries away the beautiful image, which leaves behind it no memorial of what it was. Something like this are the moral law and the informations of faith, as they present themselves to individual minds. Who can deny the existence of conscience? Who does not feel the force of its injunctions? But how dim is the illumination in which it is invested, and how feeble its influence, compared with that evidence of sight and touch, which is the foundation of physical science? How easily can we be talked out of our clearest views of duty? How does this or that moral precept crumble into nothing when we rudely handle it? How does the fear of sin pass off from us as quickly as the glow of modesty dies away from the countenance? And then we say, it is all superstition. However, after a time, we look round, and then to our surprise we see, as before, the same law of duty, the same moral precepts, the same protests against sin appearing over against us in their old places, as if they never had been brushed away, like the divine handwriting upon the wall at the banquet. Then perhaps we approach them rudely and inspect them irreverently, and accost them sceptically, and away they go again, like so many spectres, shining in their cold beauty, but not presenting themselves bodily to us, for our inspection, so to say, of their hands and their feet. And thus these awful, supernatural, bright, majestic, delicate apparitions, much as we may in our hearts acknowledge their sovereignty, are no match as a foundation of science, for the hard, palpable, material facts which make up the province of physics. Recurring to my original illustration, it is as if the India commander-in-chief, instead of being under the control of a local seat of government at Calcutta, were governed simply from London, or from the moon. In that case, he would be under a strong temptation to neglect the home government, which nevertheless in theory he acknowledged. Such, I say, is the natural condition of mankind. We depend upon a seat of government which is in another world. We are directed and governed by intimations from above. We need a local government on earth. That great institution, then, the Catholic Church, has been set up by divine mercy as a present visible antagonist, and the only possible antagonist, to sight and sense. Conscience, reason, good feelings, the instincts of our moral nature, the traditions of faith, the conclusions and deductions of philosophical religion, are no match at all for the stubborn facts, for they are facts, though there are other facts beside them, for the facts which are the foundation of physical, and in particular of medical science. Gentlemen, if you feel, as you must feel, the whisper of a law of moral truth within you, and the impulse to believe. Be sure there is nothing whatever on earth which can be the sufficient champion of these sovereign authorities of your soul, which can vindicate and preserve them to you, and make you loyal to them, but the Catholic Church. You fear they will go. You see with dismay that they are going, under the continual impression created on your mind by the details of the material science to which you have devoted your lives. It is so, I do not deny it, except under rare and happy circumstances, go they will, unless you have Catholicism to back you up in keeping faithful to them. The world is a rough antagonist of spiritual truth, sometimes with mailed hand, sometimes with pertinacious logic, sometimes with a storm of irresistible facts, it presses on against you. What it says is true, perhaps, as far as it goes, but it is not the whole truth, or the most important truth. These more important truths, which the natural heart admits in their substance, though it cannot maintain, the being of a god, the certainty of future retribution, the claims of the moral law, the reality of sin, the hope of supernatural help, of these the Church is, in matter of fact, the undaunted and the only defender. Even those who do not look on her as divine must grant as much as this. I do not ask you for more here than to contemplate and recognise her as a fact, 
as other things are facts. She has been 1,800 years in the world, and all that time she has been doing battle in the boldest, most obstinate way in the cause of the human race, in maintenance of the undeniable but comparatively obscure truths of religion. She is always alive, always on the alert, when any enemy whatever attacks them. She has brought them through a thousand perils, sometimes preaching, sometimes pleading, sometimes arguing, sometimes exposing her ministers to death, and sometimes, though rarely, inflicting blows herself, by peremptory deeds, by patient concessions. She has fought on and fulfilled her trust. No wonder so many speak against her, for she deserves it. She has earned the hatred and obloquy of her opponents by her success in opposing them. Those who even though speak against her in this day own that she was of use in a former day. The historians in fashion with us just now, much as they may disown her in their own country, where she is an actual, present, unpleasant, inconvenient monitor, acknowledge that in the Middle Ages, which are gone, in her were lodged, by her were saved, the fortunes and the hopes of the human race. The very characteristics of her discipline, the very maxims of her policy, which they reprobate now, they perceive to have been of service then. They understand and candidly avow that once she was the patron of the arts, the home and sanctuary of letters, the basis of law, the principle of order and government, and the saviour of Christianity itself. They judge clearly enough in the case of others, though they are slow to see the fact in their own age and country. And while they do not like to be regulated by her, and kept in order by her themselves, they are very well satisfied that the populations of those former sanctuaries should have been so ruled and tamed and taught by her resolute and wise teaching. And be sure of this, that as the generation now alive admits these benefits to have arisen from her presence in a state of society now gone by, so in turn, when the interests and passions of this day are passed away, will future generations ascribe to her a like special beneficial action upon this nineteenth century in which we live. For she is ever the same, ever young and vigorous, and ever overcoming new errors with the old weapons. And now I have explained, gentlemen, why it has been so highly expedient and desirable in a country like this to bring the faculty of medicine under the shadow of the Catholic Church. I say, in a country like this, for if there be any country which deserves that science should not run wild like a planet broken loose from its celestial system, it is a country which can boast of such hereditary faith, of such a persevering confessorship, of such an accumulation of good works, of such a glorious name as Ireland. Far be it from this country, far be it from the counsels of divine mercy that it should grow in knowledge and not grow in religion. And Catholicism is the strength of religion as science and system are the strength of knowledge. Aspirations such as these are met, gentlemen, I am well aware, by a responsive feeling in your own hearts. But by my putting them into words, thoughts which already exist within you are brought into livelier exercise, and sentiments which exist in many breasts hold into communion with each other. Gentlemen, it will be your high office to be the links in your generation between religion and science. Return thanks to the author of all good that he has chosen you for this work. Trust the Church of God implicitly, even when your natural judgment would take a different course from hers, and would induce you to question her prudence or her correctness. Recollect what a hard task she has, how she is sure to be criticised and spoken against, whatever she does. Recollect how much she needs your loyal and tender devotion. Recollect, too, how long is the experience gained in 1800 years, and what a right she has to claim your assent to principles which have had so extended and so triumphant a trial. Thank her that she has kept the faith safe for so many generations, and do your part in helping her to transmit it to generations after you. For me, if it has been given me to have any share in so great a work, 
I shall rejoice with a joy not such indeed as I should feel were I myself a native of this generous land, but with a joy of my own not the less pure, because I have exerted myself for that which concerns others more nearly than myself. I have had no other motive, as far as I know myself, than to attempt, according to my strength, some service to the cause of religion, and to be the servant of those to whom as a nation the whole of Christendom is so deeply indebted. And though this university and the faculty of medicine which belongs to it are as yet only in the commencement of their long career of usefulness, yet while I live, and, I trust, after life, it will ever be a theme of thankfulness for my heart and my lips, that I have been allowed to do even a little, and to witness so much, of the arduous, pleasant, and hopeful toil which has attended on their establishment. End of University Subjects Lecture 10 End of The Idea of a University by John Henry Newman Recording by Andrew Nash, Abingdon, Oxfordshire, England